All right, so my name is Larry Yang. Uh, I'm from University of Texas Libraries. Um, I'm here to talk to you about our exhibit uh, portal and how we go about building this over the last few months. So this, this project was really given to my squad as the main project in March. So we started working on it and then the pandemic hit. So then we scrambled and had to make a lot of changes. But now four or five months later, we now have soft launch uh, the portal and it's in the hand of our curators. So before I jump in, I want to talk to you about my team. So I actually work in an agile shop and we have squads uh, instead of teams. And the squad I'm on is called the Squid Storms. And my squad mates are Noah, Heather, Kevin, Dave, and Audrey, and myself. So we're the, we see ourselves as the squids uh, because we have our hand in many things and we're able to change color, like we change direction on projects uh, as needed for part of the project need. We're uh, fairly new to the library space. Most of us are two, three years in the libraries. Uh, with exception to Audrey, Audrey's been around for a while. Uh, most of us are PHP and Python background. Uh, so, and the exhibit portal we built is in uh, Ruby. So there's quite a bit of learning curve on doing the project. So this is what I hope to cover today. Uh, I'm gonna to talk to you about why we're doing all this. Uh, and then I'm gonna kind of go in the reverse order. Of, I'm gonna give you a demo of the site, then go back into the architecture and some of the struggles and things that we did uh, with the project. So at UT Library, we have many, many things uh, that's developed over uh, many years ago on various different platforms. Uh, over time, uh, technology improve, things change, uh, but it becomes difficult to unify and able to continue improve each of the exhibits because they've all built on different technology. So our mission kind of go, set out for the project is like to create a, one single platform to enable to, for UT library to continue to build and curate things and facilitate the discovery of all our stuff and provide access to everyone in the world. It's a tall task, uh, but I think we are close. So with that, we built uh, our UTL exhibit. It's at exhibit exhibits.lips.utexas.edu, and I could give you a quick demo of that. So here is our uh, exhibit uh, portal. Uh, if you're familiar with Blacklight, it's a Blacklight uh, product, and we'll go and get into that. Uh, a little bit later, um, but this is a, a spotlight. It's running spotlight, and initially, this is an exhibit that we curated, just kind of demonstrate some of the feature uh, the application can do. So, as a curator, you could highlight certain assets and whatnot, and able to create these uh, feature pages, be able to show more things, tell more of a story. Uh, these viewers are through IIIF, running the out-of-box uh, Open Sea Dragon viewers. So you have able to zoom in and pan and whatnot. As well as, we also have another one. This is a, a GIS story map that we're running inside an iframe widget. Uh, so it's a pretty powerful product and we like it. Uh, it will do search. Here's one, let's go into this first one. Uh, you have metadata associated with the asset. Uh, this is the Mirador Viewer. This is the Mirador Viewer version three. It's not production release yet. I think they're release candidate uh, currently. Uh, but we implement Mirador Viewer instead of the out of box um, Open Sea Dragon Viewer because it have more functionality allow you to do multi-page contents like this. Again, you'll be able to view zoom in and whatnot. Uh, for our exhibit, we able, per our requirement from our stakeholders, we allow users or curator to be able to have a few ways to be able to ingest the items into uh, the application to create exhibits. So we have what we call a single upload where a user could just upload an item, put in some metadata, and then it's in the exhibit. 
as well as uh, multiple ABO uh, via CSV. So they could download a template, fill all the information, same thing, kind of batch upload of the single item. We also support triple IF. So any triple IF manifest URL that's open, you pop it in here and that item's in our exhibit. So that's kind of a quick demo of its capability. Uh, it's in the hand of our curator right now. Uh, we soft launched uh, this month. Um, we don't have anything published yet. And once curator is ready, then we'll do our uh, full launch at uh, some point. So going back to the presentation, this is kind of the architecture of our overall ecosystem. So earlier, Tori kind of gave the demo of the dance ar uh, architecture. So that's our dance based on Fedora, uh, running on Fedora. Um, and that's our backend to kind of handle most of the things that we have. And then we also run uh, a GIS server uh, based on our GIS. That's our geocoded uh, stuff, right? So in both of these, then go through some sort of custom publishing uh, process. So then the, pu the publishing process really just pushing things into our triple IF so the assets can be viewed publicly, uh, pushing things into our solar, um, which is more or less kind of able to uh, allow the metadata to be able to display publicly. Um, then we have our front end portals. Uh, Tori kind of gave the demo of the collections portal, which is based on Blacklight. And we also have the geodata portal. That's uh, Blacklight running the geodata, geo Blacklight uh, plugin. And then also now our exhibit portal is a Blacklight running the Spotlight plugin. Uh, as you can see uh, on the right hand side, our dams and our RGIS are running on traditional VMs. Everything on the left is running in Docker container. We choose to do containers uh, because we find that's the most efficient way and quickest way to be able to do something and it works for us. Um, we kind of, we like to pick the best tools uh, for the situations, uh, but we unify on the container platform. So for example, the publishing methods are all in Python because our devs are most familiar with Python. So we code in that. Triple IF and Solar are kind of out of box uh, softwares. And then uh, collection, geodata and exhibit are Ruby's uh, on rail uh, apps. All right, now get more into exhibit. So like I mentioned, exhibit is based on Blacklight running the Spotlight plugin. Uh, and then we kind of add Mirador, we add MySQL, and we add SAML, and then we do our UTL customization on top of that. Um, think of that stack. Uh, when you're running things in a container, container is fresh every time you build. So every time when we run a build, and we do this at least once a week, you're installing brand new Blacklight, Spotlight, Mirador, and it's fresh out of the box with nothing in it. And the, uh, it's nice to do that. So then it allow any sort of upgrade, uh, you'll be able to isolate any issue that you have before you put in your customization. But uh, container are stateless. That means that it doesn't remember who you are or what you did. So for that, to solve that, we externalized kind of the three main piece to keep uh, any of the application running. So solar kind of in charge of all the metadata. We have the storage, kind of keep track of all the asset that's being ingested into the system. We have a database, in this case, MySQL, to keep track of what's the information related to the exhibit. So those three things are not in the same container externally. So they could keep track of what had happened. So as we rebuild the container each time, it's able to remember uh, where you had left off. So as I mentioned, we use Spotlight. Uh, Spotlight, there's a very nice project site. Uh, if you're interested in doing something like that, I welcome you to go look into it more. Um, it's developed mostly by Stanford Library. So they deserve all the credit to make this happen. And we, we kind of just use it. So, uh, and it works well for us. And on their site, you know, they say it's full feature, self-service, integrated and flexible. Uh, it, it has a tons of feature. It's definitely self-service. We build things so our curator can do things without any intervention from the developers. Uh, it's integrated in a way where existing digital assets can go right in. 
it's pretty flexible as you uh, you saw that we put in our layer of customization on top of the thing on top of spotlight and so far it, it, it works well uh, so doing this wasn't without challenge uh, docker rising spotlight was uh, was not easy uh, spotlight project kind of gave you uh, a, a pretty detailed instruction on how do you install spotlight how to get it up and running uh, that's great uh, there are no instruction on how to get that into a container uh, so that's where our work kind of come in uh, but these three kind of like main point where we we struggle through so kind of i'm going to bring you through a journey of how we got here um, so for example the web server uh, we you Initially, we start off using uh, Passenger as the Ruby uh, rail web server. Uh, and then we end up switching to Puma. And then, uh, the reason why we use Passenger is that uh, we, didn't, we didn't have a whole lot of experience running uh, Rails app prior to building the collection portal, the geodata portal, and the exhibit portals. So we, need, we know we need a web server. We need to find one with Google. That was the first one pop up, so I, we use that one. Turns out that wasn't a so great idea uh, because Stanford kind of built things, uh, built Spotlight with Puma. So many of the things kind of already pre-configured to use with Puma. We have a lot of issue with that like, uploading, downloading different things. Uh, we're troubleshooting the code and see where we could write the code to overcome some of the issues. Uh, turns out. In the end, we, by switching to Puma, most of the problem goes away and a few minor things we took care of. Um, our container generically run uh, Red Hat and midway through the project, we had to switch to CentOS uh, because we ran into an issue with SSL on our Red Hat was not up to, as up to date as we need. And so we made a switch to CentOS and to keep going. Database, uh, Spotlight, uh, come SQLite out of the box. And like I said, we externalized uh, database and we switched that to MySQL. So allow our app to kind of remember what's happening with things. All right, our next challenge. Uh, it has a viewer come out of the box, well, it's an open sea dragon. It can show uh, and talk to Travel IF, which is what we prefer to use. Uh, but it doesn't do page content well. So our stakeholders' requirements for us to be able to do page content. So we look at uh, Mirador, uh, as we had experience using Mirador on the collections portal. Um, so projectmirador.org is their website. Again, it's, a, it's an excellent project. Um, so install Mirador. Uh, was not was pretty easy if you're running a VM. Again, we're doing things on containers, so things are gets a little trickier. Uh, we end up doing what uh, Mirador project called the easy installations, where we kind of just steal the JavaScript file for Mirador, plug that into our app, declare it, initialize it, and then tell our app to use that. And it works it, to the most extent but we lost the ability to be able to run some of the plugin, like downloading the assets, uh, do some image manipulation, like colors and flipping and whatnot. So uh, the official way to be able to do this is running another uh, React frame, uh, JavaScript framework. So we're looking into doing that. Um, Mirador is still in a non pro release currently. Um, so when we first start with project, uh, in early spring, uh, early spring was beta seven, and then they release another one. We make an upgrade, and they release another one, RC one. And last week was RC five. Uh, there was definitely some challenges in working with some of these things. Uh, each time when there's a new release, because it's JavaScript and many other JavaScripts running on the site as well, that there's always some sort of JavaScript conflict from one to another. These are two different Spotlight and Mirador are two different projects. Uh, so our job is kind of like integrating those and solve all the error there is. Uh, so if you're doing something similar, we could share a story and help you out. So Mirador. And then there's another one. So uh, uh, as we're doing all these things, uh, we're learning a lot of things about Spotlight and Rubies and Rails and whatnot. 
so in, in Spotlight, there's a function to delete the exhibit. This was a pretty interesting one because uh, delete works. When you delete, it was gone. It's not there on the screen. But we noticed that if you put the, you create another exhibit with the same name and using the same slug, and slug is used to generate URL, and everything that exhibit just comes back. And one would think that, then we just delete all these things. So dig more into the code that a delete only happens on the database. Like I mentioned, there's kind of like three pieces to power spotlight. There's a database, there's solar, and there's storage. Solar in the storage was not touch. So the delete wasn't really a full function in our mind. So we created a task to kind of go in to fix delete. So we fix delete. Now a delete will delete things from database, delete things from solar, delete the asset that's, if it's not triple IF, uh, from the storage. Great. Now when you delete, it's totally gone. And after we did all that, uh, there was another function where allow a user to export an existing exhibit and import it. And import stopped working. So now we dig more into that. It turns out import only restore uh, data uh, records to the database. It doesn't touch solar. It doesn't touch storage. So now you can kind of piece together with that. Oh, that's how it works. Uh, but at UT, when we do things, uh, we have many, many things. So when we delete something, um, we really want to recover that space to repurpose it. Um, so we really need to lead to work the delete the way we had it. And talking to our stakeholders, import is no longer as important. So breaking import is totally okay. So that was an interesting one. And there was many others. Uh, but that was the one we picked to talk about. And I mentioned that we do local development and local development is pretty cool. So I work on the squad with five other developers and each of us able to take a task and we're able to do things uh, without interfering from, uh, with each other. And that means we're able to do, try many things very quickly. Uh, but on this project, so earlier I showed that there's a way to kind of ingest item through single upload or CSV upload. We ran into an issue where developer A ingests the item on their machine. It will show up on solar, it will show up on database, but the asset is nowhere to be found. So Mirador Viewer is, looks like it's had a problem where it can't display the asset uh, on the developer B's machine. It works fine on developer A's machine, developer B doesn't see it. And the reason for that, the asset lives on developer A's machine. And same thing when you're looking from our server, that asset isn't available. So we kind of had to engineer the solution where how we could create a storage and make it available to all the things that need to access it. So we provision a storage, uh, our state storage is using NetApp. And we, through Active Directory permissioning, we attach that storage on each developer's machine, as well as attaching that same uh, storage on the server for the exhibit container. And everybody need to rewrite. Uh, so there was some trickiness with the permission, but once everything is done, now everything one developer's machine does shows up on another. And you could see that where this has now become easily scalable, where this is essentially five servers running the same app, all doing things at the same time. And that points out to another thing that why we like Docker, uh, because it's isolation and scalability. But so that kind of works out for us. And uh, we're, we're, we're a Docker shop, but we've only been doing Docker for the last year and a half. So we're fairly new at it. So we're learning. Uh, so what you see on the screen is, this is a command every time we build a Docker image our dev will need to run this command to run the server, run the Spotlight app. It's like a half page. Obviously, we don't type it every time. We we'll copy and paste. Uh, but it's still cumbersome to do. And then sometimes things change. 
uh, and then you had the main modifications. So, uh, and there's a little thing called Docker Compose, and I could show you that really quick. Uh, where's my Docker Compose? So in here, just like that command, we're able to set up a bunch of local environment variable that you need to run the, the applications. And we'll point it here. And then we tell them, say, if you are uh, not familiar with Docker, Docker files like kind of the main engine will tell you how to build the container. We we'll say, hey, use Docker file to build this container, declare the port as 4,000, attach these five volume and build Spotlight. And so then from there, with one command, Docker compose up, and so type in this whole thing, you're able to run it. Uh, so we kind of take this like learning as we go approach um, most of our projects. Um, we don't know everything from the start, but we learn a lot of things as we go out, uh, go through it. So uh, we, we soft launch, uh, but soft launch without SAML, uh, because what well, we found the integration of SAML with Spotlight was not easy. Uh, so this is where my opportunity to kind of reach out to the community. If you've done this with SAML, uh, please, please talk to us uh, and maybe you could be able to help us out. Um, we able to get something working, uh, but like I mentioned, our local development environment that is going to break it because if you don't know SAML, SAML is what you do to do authentications uh, and you request a authentication service say, here's our credentials. Uh, this is good. Can we log in? You whitelist where the request is coming from. Because we do local development, obviously we're not whitelisting each developer's machine. So therefore we can't make requests and therefore we can't authenticate locally. And that will kind of ruin our local development environment. So we're still looking to see how we could solve that. Uh, but it's a work in progress. Lastly, work still continues. Uh, our, our stakeholder and the business folks really love what we have done with Spotlight. And they want more of it. They want more Spotlight. Uh, they have all different use cases that have different needs that may require one or many more of Spotlight. And also, uh, Travai 3.0 has just been released. And we're looking to do that uh, in hope to do AV content with our exhibits. And um, so if you've done something like that, we'd love to uh, see what you did and maybe you could help us out too. And that's all I have for today. And here's my contact. Again, if you're doing something similar and you, you need help, we'd love to help you out and share a story. All right, if you have any questions, I'm here. Great, thank you, Larry, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, great to hear all of the all the little gotchas that you've had to deal with along the way. I know many of us have had to deal with those and we certainly have with like spotlight delete and things like that. So, right. um, okay, anybody have any questions at this time? Feel free to punch it into the chat or uh, unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Okay, maybe I'll start with a question uh, and if anyone else has one, feel free to jump in later. Um, how uh, the, the Docker stuff you've done is really interesting. How, and you mentioned that you support certain items because the containers are always being replaced like solar and, and your database and so forth. How is solar uh, stored? Is, do you use solar, solar cloud, which of course is not a cloud by itself. But we'll, we'll yeah, we, we use solar cloud and solar cloud itself is running in the Docker container. Uh, yeah, that's something we'll we'll be exploring our end as well. Yeah, uh, I think solar works pretty good. And there's also, also a, was an elastic search. We're, we're evaluating all of them. Uh, we have no bias toward any product as long as free. Yeah, that's our approach as well. Uh, I haven't, I mean, Blacklight's tightly tied to solar as we understand. So I, I have not heard of a Elasticsearch implementation, although I'd certainly be interested to hear if anyone has tried or accomplished that. Um, okay, other questions for, for Larry? I had the, the same question as um, Todd earlier about kind of how, how these, um, this system would interact 
or is different or is the same as the uh, dams Tori was showing us. And it mm -hmm. looks like, um, you know, they have two different purposes. So is the way that a curator would grab something for their exhibit from the digital collection, that would be that manifest or the triple IF URI? Right, so, so any, uh, our intention is we have front end and we have back end. And we, we want to make those layer very distinct. One is for scalability. Uh, we, want, we want to scale the front end. A lot of time we want to leave the back end alone. And the second is access. Uh, there are less people need to access our back end versus the front end is to totally public. So the thought process is that we have stuff that's in collections, in geodata portal. These are public things, uh, but it doesn't tell a story. And that's where exhibit kind of comes in, mm -hmm. right? You now able to grab, or curator, able to grab things from collections, from geodata portal, and create an exhibit and tell the special story. And we're working on integration to be able to kind of link back to collections, link back to geodata portal. So when uh, users accessing e any of the portal. So if you're looking at a map in geodata portal and it turns out there's a special exhibit uh, already created, we want to be able to tell them that so they could to help with the discoverability as well as uh, because the exhibit are prettier. So there mm -hmm. are probably more people who want to access that. And it in turn, create visibility into our digital collections in geodata portal of, uh, not only we have this, but we also, part, as part of that collection, we have many other things. And again, trying to provide access to all for all the things we have. 